My name is Yupari, and I hope you all are having a wonderful week, and I wish to invite you to this week's portrait painting demonstration. And in this week's video, we're going to be guiding you through the development involved in creating this painting with an emphasis on the big picture. And here we have an image of our model, Jen, and I'm going to keep a picture of her to the top left corner of your screen so you can refer to it as I develop the painting. So let's start off this painting with a preliminary drawing. Now the preliminary drawing does a number of things for your painting. Uh, first and foremost, it kind of gives you a second chance. So what you do in your drawing doesn't necessarily have to transfer over to your painting. So that is, you can take the best stuff out of your drawing and transfer it over to your painting, which will make the end result that much stronger in my opinion. So I'm going to be starting off working on pastel paper with medium vine charcoal and if you want to know exactly which materials that I'll be using for this video all of that information will be typed in the description box below so if you're curious as to what materials I'm using at any point in the video just scroll down and you'll be able to see uh, exactly what I used. So I started off this drawing with the outside shape, a rough indication of the outside shape. And I'm going to be working the big picture. So when I'm trying to come up with a composition, I think about the edges, the four corners of the picture. So I think about the space from the side of the shoulder, from the left, to the corner of the paper. And I think about the rightmost corner as well. And not just the four corners, but pretty much the entire boundary of the rectangle that I'm working on. And this drawing paper is the same size as the canvas that I'm going to transfer this drawing onto. So now I have a rough shape for the head. So I have a rough indication for where I think the head is going to fit within the large outside shape. So we're working outside shapes and inside shapes. So outer shapes and inner shapes using straight lines and angles, keeping yourself at about an arm's length away from your drawing, it's going to be a very useful tool. So now you'll notice that I have a cloth there. So I'm using a little chamois cloth as an eraser. So now I'm going to solidify a little bit on the bottom of the chin. So I'm guessing that the bottom of the chin is going to go about there. We have a strong straight line for the neck, and now we're going to be blocking in a little mass right here for the hair. And just a simple rectangular shape can do a lot in terms of explaining where something begins and where something ends. So now we have a much more concise understanding of where the inner shapes are going to fit within the parameters of the larger shapes that we established on the paper. And another thing I should note is that I am trying to figure out where I want the head to be placed in the paper such that it will go exactly in the same spot on the canvas. But if I want to move the head a little bit higher up, down, left, or white, wherever I want to move the head when I do the transfer, I have the liberty to do that. So that is a very uh, strong benefit to creating a preliminary drawing. And really the secret to most uh, realistic or most traditional painting is drawing. Believe it or not, drawing is really the most important aspect in terms of creating a believable three-dimensional image. So now we have a little corner there for the ear. Notice that I'm still working very much outside shapes and inside shapes. So now I'm going to be putting in a rough little indication here for the axis of the eyes. And pretty much a simple rectangular looking blob like that will do. And now I'm going to go ahead and start to put in a center line. So this center line divides the face in half. We human beings have bilateral symmetry, so one side of the face is mirrored by another side of the face. And so having that center line helps you establish 
exactly what turn the model is making in relation to you. So now I'm starting to put a little accent in for the corner of one of the eye sockets. And now we have a little angle there for the eyebrows. Still very much using straight lines and angles. And I'm trying to minimize the amount of marks that I place down. I really want the marks to be very minimal, very loose, and very specific. So now we have a little axis for the eyes. And now we have a little axis mark here for the bottom of the nose. And now we have another little mark here for the bottom of the mouth. And these are our rough estimations, our rough guesstimations. But the only thing that needs to be that accurate at this point is the placement of the head on the surface and the turn that the model is making in relation to you. Now, if you were working uh, directly with paint on the canvas, then you would have to be extra sure that the placement of the head is to your liking. But if you're doing a preliminary drawing, like I said before, you don't really have to worry too much about the placement of the head, just the actual structure of the head that you're trying to convey. So now I'm solidifying a little bit more of a shadow shape on the corner of the side plane of the forehead. So let's talk about the word plane, and I'm going to be using that a lot. So a plane is a three-dimensional conceptualized idea of a flat sheet in space, a flat sheet in three-dimensional space. So you can think of the entire drawing pad that I'm working on as a single plane within the realm of the three-dimensional space that is my studio. So again, with straight lines and angles, I'm starting to map out kind of a rough shadow shape for the bottom of the nose. So here we have a little corner right about here. So I've tried to relate the edges of the nose to the edges of the mouth and making sure that they are following along within the center line. The center line is going to be that guiding bit of information that is going to help me make sure that the features are oriented in the right place with respect to one another. So here we have some more axes. Uh, indications, sorry, we have some indications of the pupils within the eyes based on the axes of the eyes that we drew in there. And everything is rough at this stage. So everything is very much work in progress. And let's call them stand-ins. Each shape that we have placed in there uh, for each feature is kind of a stand-in. Everything is going to be malleable, variable, able to be in flux. So the idea is we're trying to train our eyes to see shape and to conceptualize what we're looking at in front of us, not as a human being, rather as a set of shapes. And we relate these shapes to one another, and for better or for worse. If the shapes are in the wrong place, which most likely is the case in the beginning. Don't worry, everyone makes mistakes. It's important to be honest with yourself. Relate one shape to its surrounding shapes. Relate each shape to one another, and in doing so, just like in a word search where you don't see a word immediately, after enough inspection, you will eventually find what you're looking for. It's all about really having that patience. And another thing I will say is take breaks as often as you can. It's important to stand back and to look at the big picture, but it's also important to take breaks. And I recommend at least every 20 minutes, or you can take breaks every 15 minutes, but I would not want to... I would not advise working more than 20 minutes at a time without a break. So here we're starting to create some curves. So notice that a curve is being created by a set of straight lines, just like an architect would construct a diagram for a bridge using straight lines and angles to construct a curve. We're going to be transferring that same kind of thought process into creating curves that we're going to fit on the face. So now we just etched in a little bit more of a value for the cast shadow. So we're going to move around these shapes and try to 
make sure that they are fitting within the parameters of one another. So at this stage, we're gonna spend a while moving the shapes around, tinkering with them until we get them to be exactly where we want them to be. Light and shadow is gonna be the most important bit of information that we get out of this drawing. If anything, we really want to get the light and dark shapes as accurate as we can possibly get them. So after a little bit of work uh, within moving these shapes around, we're going to be able to assess our drawing based on our eyes. Moving our eyes back and forth right after we finish uh, flattening out these shadows with this bristle brush again. That's just a just a regular bristle brush that I use to stump in the shadows just to make them a little bit more smooth. But once we have all of our shapes in check and we think that they're correct, that's a great time to take a break and then come back and assess how the shapes are fitting in relation to one another. So let's do a little bit more work and come back. So here we are with the light and shadow shapes as accurate as I could possibly get them. So I took a break, came back, saw that there were some errors. So the first error that I noticed is the angle between uh, the eyes. So this is how I'm gonna correct the problem. So I'm gonna take the uh, bristle brush and I'm going to fog out the eyes. Notice how I just blurred it out and I'm gonna blur this area of the nose out as well. But the mouth seemed to be pretty much okay, but I'm going to fog it out a little bit too. So you can also refer to this as creating a ghost. Not the scary kind of ghost, of course, but just a ghost image of what we had before. And let's fog the forehead because I, I think, because I think there's a little too much of the forehead showing. So this is how we're going to make the corrections. The first thing I noticed is that perhaps the forehead needs to come down just a little bit and it's also one of the easiest corrections to make so i'm just going to with a bunch of straight lines and angles uh, move the line of the forehead down and i'm showing you this because i want you to know that these things happen and this is why the preliminary drawing is so useful because we're gonna make mistakes and why not make mistakes in the preliminary drawing and correct them once we transfer onto canvas and make our paintings that much more powerful albeit this does seem kind of more tedious compared to my usual way of approaching a portrait painting so here we are solidifying the angle between the two eyebrows now with a kneaded eraser I'm going to be pushing this a little bit lower. And when you're trying to gauge angles between shapes, it's a really good idea to close one eye. I'm pretty much keeping my left eye closed throughout this entire process that is trying to get these angles. Notice I'm gonna draw a very definitive angle right here. So this straight line, I want it to cut across between the tear ducts and the corners of the eyes. And we really want to make sure that this angle is as accurate as we can possibly make it. It will make the painting that much stronger, even though it may be painful in the beginning with the drawing to make these corrections. Even the angle of the nose was a little bit off. So making those corrections, I now see that these lines should fit in relation to one another. So the change was created by blurring out the eyes and then reestablishing that axis where the two eyes are creating an angle with respect to one another. So now we have indications for the tear ducts and a little vertical line to make sure that the tear duct is matching somewhat with the corner of the nose. So now we're gonna go and reinforce the drawing after these corrections have been made. So just like we did with the light and shadow drawing when we blurred this out, as you saw, it had some light and shadow shapes that were well-defined. 
but in the wrong place. So that's why I usually say, keep your shapes as simple and easy for you to understand. So when the time comes to make those corrections, those corrections will also be simple and easy to understand. And don't be discouraged uh, when it comes time to make these corrections on your drawing. Believe me, it is a wonderful thing to find out that you're wrong. Because when you find out you're wrong, then it gives you hope that you can figure out how to make it correct. So now look at the corner of the nose. So we have a little accent for one nostril and an accent for the other nostril. And I want these dark accents to follow that line that I created. So that is the angle of the nose is such that the nose to the right of your screen, so the nostril to the right of your screen looks like it's a little bit lower than the nostril to the left of your screen. So this little L shape uh, that I created here is going to help me define the corner of the side of the wing of the nose. And I wanna make sure that the uh, wing of the nose from one side of the nose is following the axis, the angle of the axis that I drew on the other side of the nose. And since the face is in three quarter, the features are also going to be in three quarter as well. So that means I'm going to be seeing more of the wing of the nose on this side. So the side to the left of your screen, then I am going to be seeing uh, the wing of the nose to the right side of your screen. So right about here, you're going to be seeing a little bit less of the wing of the nose. And right about here, you're going to be seeing a little bit more of it. So now let's solidify the light and shadow shape just a tiny bit. So now we have the drawing, the preliminary drawing completed, and we have covered it with tracing paper. And we're going to go over the lines with a pastel pencil. So now I'm going to reinforce the angle between the tear ducts using this little board here. And I just want to make sure that the axes of the eyes are fitting within a straight line. This is a very useful thing to do during the transfer process because it allows you to work right over this. And if you're working in charcoal with your preliminary drawing like I did, make sure to spray some fixative some workable fixative on your charcoal drawing before you place the transfer paper over. So now I'm going over the outlines yet again with my medium vine charcoal, just very much going over the outlines, trying to follow them as closely as possible. So now I have flipped it over and I'm ready to start to work on top of the pastel drawing. So I'm going over it with a blue pen. So it's going to be very useful to use a colored pen and just trace very firmly on top of your outlines and have yourself some classical music and a cup of tea because this does require a little bit of patience. But when it's done and you're taking out the transfer paper, it's almost like when you receive a package in the mail from the UPS or something or you receive your Christmas present. It's a very wonderful thing to see all of your Hard work created in the preliminary drawing transfer over successfully to your canvas. So now we're going to be going in with oil paint. So I'm going to be using water mixable oil paint. So I used water mixable oil paint burnt umber color to go over the outlines once again. So now the photo reference is back because I'm going to be putting in the dark shapes in the most emphatic dark shapes, the most important dark shapes uh, to develop the form on the features, and that is the shapes of light and dark. And I stylized a little bit with the lips. I didn't need to put in the dark for the lips there. I kind of just wanted to put a little bit of dark for the lips. Now the local value of the lips, that is the lips themselves, are darker than the surrounding flesh, but not that much. I just put that in there because I wanted to put that in there. So now I'm just going to uh, fill in some more of the darks surrounding these shadow shapes. And let's refer to this stage as the poster stage. 
So the paint is fairly thin and I'm using a fast drying medium with my water mixable oil paints. So the reason I'm using water mixable oil paints is because water mixable oil paints tend to dry a little bit faster than regular oil paints. And add to that a fast drying medium and this thing dries extremely fast but not too fast. It's not like acrylic paint or anything like that. It will stay workable for a few hours but after a few hours it will start to settle and then the next day it will be dry. So for the underpainting I want to fill the darks with a very thin and transparent layer of burnt umber oil paint. So now I'm going to go in with some zinc white and a lot of zinc white actually with the burnt umber. And I'm going to fill in the, I'm trying to cover the whites. I'm going to try to cover the whites on the face. Now I could leave them and then just apply the flesh tones on top of the whites, but I find that that's often kind of difficult. So I'm going to go over it with this, uh, you can call it a false color or whatever you want to call it. It's just to cover the whites. And at the same time, I'm going to be uh, painting in a little bit of a transition here. Uh, for the dark light. So that band that I just painted in there actually is referred to as the dark light and it is the half tone that exists in the light just as we approach the shadow shape. And we'll return to that kind of thinking when we are in the form modeling stage. So just filling in just a little bit of that dark light, but we're not trying to render any kind of form here. We're just trying to cover the surface. And another thing I should mention in particular with the water mixable oil paints is that I would not advise relying too much on water to thin out the paint. Now I know that's what uh, it says to do, but water mixable oil paints the advantage to them is not only do they dry faster, but they clean extremely easily. They clean extremely well with water. I mean, when you apply, when you dip this brush into a container of water, it's almost like the oil paint just falls off, which is great for cleaning the brush. Not so great for thinning out the paint. So be careful with the amount of water that you use with your water mixable oil paints. And if you're using traditional oil paints, everything that I will be describing to you is the exact same. The only difference is with the water mixables, you do not want to thin it out too much with the water. Now with regular oil paints, the same kind of thinking applies. You don't want to use too much mineral spirits to thin out your paint because then the paint will tend to kind of fall off. But you're a little safer. Uh, with the traditional oil paints, especially if you use something like odorless mineral spirits or such. Now I'm going to be painting each layer thicker than the previous layer. So this layer of paint is going to be the thinnest, extremely thin. So we're going to be painting thick paint over thin paint. And so now we just put in a little indication of a half tone for the side plane of the nose, just a tiny bit, not very necessary, but I just felt like painting that in there while I had to paint. And I would recommend not going overboard with the form modeling uh, at this stage. What I'm very much trying to do is to create a posterized image. So that is an image that contains only the essential bits of information of light and shadow. Now sometimes I will uh, render out the underpainting to a much further uh, level of refinement. Uh, oftentimes I will do that but with this one I wanted it to just cover the lights so that I could come back in once this dries the next day uh, to apply a form modeling pass with color. So that's what we're going to do once we're done covering all of the lights here. Pretty much, I'm pretty much just dry brushing, just scumbling the paint onto the surface as you can tell. And I should mention I'm working on acrylic primed 
linen. It's not a very expensive linen, linen canvas. It's very much your regular, everyday, normal linen canvas that you'll find at an, an art store. So here we are. We're going to cover a little bit more of the shadow shape, actually. So I just thought that the shadow shape uh, for the side plane of the face was just a little too light, even for an underpainting. So let's just cover it. And the paint that I placed earlier hack had actually started to settle in. So this is almost like a second layer already with the underpainting. So that just goes to show just how fast the water mixables dry when you use the fast drying medium. And again, if you want to know exactly which materials that I'm using for this, all of that information is typed up in the description box below. And I will suggest when you're scrubbing in the paint in this fashion, try and use a paintbrush that you don't really care too much about destroying because scrubbing in the paint in this kind of fashion, it does, it does beat up the paintbrush a little bit. So here we are. So let's talk about the palette. So we'll be using zinc white, burnt umber, alizarin crimson, cadmium red, yellow ochre, cadmium yellow, sap green, ultramarine blue, and ivory black. So this is the next day. So the very next day the underpainting is dry. So we're going to start off with the darks. So we're going to apply a thicker passage of oil paint into the cast shadow just to emphasize the delineation between light and shadow. Light and shadow are the two most important values in terms of creating the illusion of a three-dimensional form in space. If you really think about it, the extension of a two-dimensional idea to a three-dimensional idea involves a shadow. You must have a shadow in there. If you have a three-dimensional object in space and light is being casted onto it, I will guarantee you that there is a shadow somewhere in that realm. So covering the light and shadow and making them as distinguished as possible is going to be the best tactic towards getting your painting to contain a great deal of depth. So notice how I switched brushes. So I have a dark dark brush, which is this brush here, and then the shadow brush. So I'm going to be using another uh, thick appli thicker application of oil paint, but the consistency is still fairly thin. And I'm using my fast drying medium to thin out the paint a little bit. And I will admit I'm using a tiny bit of water to help me thin out my water mixable oil paints. And uh, for those of you that are interested in water mixable oil paints or are curious about them, I think and I believe that they are very good if you're going to try and layer your painting in this kind of fashion. I think they were created, I think, more for a traditional type of uh, paint application where you're painting in thicker layers on top of thinner layers. Uh, but if you're going to be trying to work more directly, so that is, if you're going to try to create a painting wet on wet, all in one sitting, it's going to be a little bit more difficult with the water mixables, in my opinion. And that is simply because it takes a little bit uh, more pigment to create the effect of chroma with water mixables than with traditional oil paints. And I think that's because the water mixable oil paints probably have, now this is just a, an idea, this is just a wild guess, I'm not sure if this, this is true, but I think that the water mixable oil paints might have less pigment in them. Maybe it's the brand that I'm using, but in any case that brand is going to be given to you in the description box below in case you're wondering. Maybe you know of a brand that's a little bit, uh, a little different from the one that I'm using. Who knows? 
But in any case, I'm applying a darker wash onto the dark shape of the hair. And I'm not trying to go jet black with it, but I am using a fair amount of ivory black into the mixture. And simply by scrubbing it onto the surface, I'm also creating a type of transparency. Now this type of transparency is very, uh, I think it's very beautiful in oil paintings to have a little bit of transparency showing through, especially in the darks, like an old master painting where you see a little bit of the underpainting showing through the corners of the canvas. I think it's a fairly neat thing. Now it's pretty much a stylized thing, but I think it's pretty nifty. So now with a little piece of paper towel, I actually, uh, corrected a little bit of a drawing mistake I covered over the forehead uh, and I didn't want to cover from that area so I wiped it off with the paper towel a little piece of paper towel so now with a little more paint I'm going into the area that I believe is the darkest area and it's going to be on this corner of the side of the hair. Now, it's not the darkest in the entire painting. The darkest area is probably going to be somewhere behind the corner of the ear. And that's because it's going to be receiving the less, the least, sorry, the least amount of light. So now with just a tad bit of burnt umber, I'm actually going to go ahead and make that area a little bit darker. So I'm working two shapes in relation to one another, very much like I would be if this was an Ala Prima painting, working one shape in relation to its surrounding shape. So that little dark that we painted in there behind the ear is conceptually the darkest area, meaning in theory it is the darkest area because it's the area that is very much hidden from the light because it's hidden behind the ear. And so now let's talk a little bit about the aesthetics and perception. So reality and perception are two very, uh, very interesting topics to talk about. So for the background, notice that the background is very much a neutral greenish, kind of a neutral green gray. And I wanted to throw in a blue. So I just threw in that blue in there. And don't worry, I'm going to bring down the saturation of that blue a little bit later. But I kind of wanted that background to be blue. That's kind of how I saw the painting in my head. Having more of a uh, contrast between the warms of the flesh and the cools in the background. And so now I'm just going to fill in a little bit more of a shape for the hair. So the Reality and perception are two very uh, interesting things that go hand in hand because the way we perceive things is going to impact the way we paint things. So the way that we think we see something is going to be influencing the way we actually paint something. And the way we want to see something is also going to influence that. So I wanted the background to be a little bit more bluish. And you'll also... Uh, see later on in the painting, I end up editing some things out of the uh, clothing that the model is going to wear. So in particular, I'm going to eliminate a little piece of green fabric later on. And so that's also referred to as artistic license. So let's get into some of the colors and form modeling for the portrait now. So I started out with the dark light. So that dark band of value that I was talking about before in the underpainting, this is the band of value. Just as light starts to turn away into the shadow. And it's going to be the most important value transition to describe the curvature of the form. So now I'm going to be trying to mix up value per value, the turning planes away from the light. So each area that I'm painting in is a plane in relation to the space. So let's think about the planes on a three-dimensional surface, kind of like the earth and the sun. So some of the planes are going to be receiving the most light. So those are going to be like areas on the earth that are going to be receiving the most sunlight and are going to be pretty much 
in a nice and sunny day, unless the weather is raining or anything like that. But the area is furthest away from the light at the same time, at the same relative time, are going to be receiving less light. And therefore, they will be in shadow. And so in that location on the Earth, they are going to be in the night time. So let's think about if our model is a planet and the sun is facing the planet overhead or a little bit in the front right about here, this area right here is going to be pretty much in midday and the area to the corner of the ear is going to be pretty much midnight away from the sunlight and therefore they will be ready to go to bed. So in any case, enough of that analogy. So we're going to be analyzing each plane in relation to the light. And we're also going to be thinking of the relative color between one plane and its corresponding planes. So this area right here, I perceive it to be a little bit more on the orange-ish side in relation to the surrounding planes. So the big picture is first developed through the idea of the large shapes of value and color, but we did that through the development of a strong linear drawing. And then we covered the darks first, which then is giving us the freedom to work in the form modeling. So now each little individual plane, as we sculpt our way around the forms, is going to be further describing the illusion of the form. Notice now that the forehead is starting to look much more volumetric with just these little indications of planes. So now we're going to start to place in a little value right here for the glabella. And this is the glabella, and it's the plane that's turning away from the light as we approach the nose. So the forehead is now turning away from the light right here. So if this were, again, an area on a planet, this would be kind of like dusk, just kind of, kind of dark, but not yet dark, dark. So in any case, we're rolling further across the forms and we're analyzing conceptually what this plane is doing or where it is in relation to the light. So this area here is going to be a little bit darker. So now I'm going to be mixing up a different value. So let's let's move our way right up here so this let's make a little smooth transition between the frontal ridge of the forehead which is this area right here right beneath the highlight is the frontal ridge of the forehead as we roll our way down towards the glabella and so let's put in let's sneak in just a tiny bit more of the cadmium yellow and more of the zinc white into this mixture. So just a little bit more of the zinc white will go into this mixture. Notice how much more paint we're using with this uh, passage of paint. We're definitely adding much more paint. And we're doing it with a very simple uh, size one round brush. Not really thinking about the brush strokes so much as thinking about the large planes in relation to one another. So let's just scatter just a little bit more light down here as the plane starts to uh, roll further away from the light source. Now with a little bit of alizarin crimson into this little area of the palette. Notice that the values on the palette are kind of in a, a value gradation where they're lighter at the top and darker at the bottom. 
keeping that arrangement on the palette actually uh, helps me out when I try to relate values on the painting itself. So this area here is going to be getting a little bit darker, so I'm still painting in these darks kind of in a thin fashion, but still progressively using more and more paint as these forms develop. And I usually like to start off with the forehead when I'm working in this type of fashion because the forehead is a very uh, it's a very forgiving structure in my opinion than starting off with something like an eye. And eyes and eyes are in my opinion a little bit more demanding to uh, to portray. So here's a little bit more dark for the eyebrow. And with a little less pressure, we're kind of letting some of the underpainting show just in the corners of the eyebrows. And that's pretty much just an aesthetic effect. And remember, you're not trying to copy the model. You're not trying to copy the photograph. Rather, you're trying to relate the shapes to one another and paint what the image looks like to you. So now just a little bit more dark onto the eyes. So these these areas of the eyes are going to be kind of the darkest. And this model does have very, very prominent dark eyes. I usually don't paint the eyes too dark, but this model in particular has uh, very elegant and naturally dark eyes. So I felt like that was something I, I had to emphasize in the painting. So now we have a, a cooler mixture for the white of the eye known as the sclera. So it is very light, but I'm going to start it off kind of in the middle tone. And I'm going to use a little bit more of the zinc white with the ivory black in a tiny bit of the flesh tone mixture to get a more true color for the uh, light of the eye. The light of the eye is something you kind of want to err on being a little bit cooler than warmer. So sneaking in a little bit of ultramarine blue would not hurt with this process. So just a little bit more of a touch here for the light of the sclera should help out. Now let's get a little bit of this dark mixture down here with this tiny little size zero round brush. And here we have a little tiny accent for the tear duct of the eye on one side, tear duct of the eye on the other side. Now with sap green and alizarin crimson, I tell you sap green and alizarin crimson were meant for each other. So now we're going to put in a, a nice neutral dark color for the cast shadow of the nose. So this area right here, I'm kind of just scumbling on the paint onto it. And I still want to make sure that that underpainting shows throughout these transparent layers of oil paint. And again, using a fast drying medium is really going to help you out if you're going to try to work in this fashion because you can work one section, such as the forehead, let it be. So work on the forehead for like however long you want to work on it, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour. And then you can set it aside and work on another shape, such as this area of the mouth here, and allow the forehead to dry as you're painting in these shapes. I really do like these fast drying mediums a little bit more nowadays. So one accent of the mouth and then the corresponding accent of the mouth. And now we have the bottom accent of the mouth. Notice with just a few touches and a few value changes, we already have a very strong uh, depth of form for the mouth. So now we're gonna start to uh, paint in the dark light for the side plane of the face. So this is the zygomatic region of the portrait. So this is the cheekbone area. And remember that dark light being the division between light and 
shadow is going to be the most important value gradation to describe the curvature of the form but there's a little bit more to it so with the color imagine you're in a dark room and you're presented with very dark or very bright roses right in front of you in the dark room do you see the red of the roses probably not so if you're in a light room and you're presented with these roses you will see the bright red of the roses so just like you see more red in the light and less in the dark the same kind of idea will apply to the chroma of your colors so as you approach the shadow the chroma of the skin tones will drop so they will be less saturated unless of course you have something like a very bright halogen light or something uh, on the shadow side of the model but in this type of lighting the chroma and the saturation so the chroma is the brightness of the color and that brightness drops as you approach the shadow side and right about here on the corner of the side of the nose that kind of thing is happening also um, when we get to the top of the nose we will be seeing more and more of the pink flesh tones of the, uh, the face So right about here, it's going to be a little darker and a little bit more greenish. So this area here surrounding the mouth. So this little dark structure here is known as the orbicularis oris. And it is the structure that contains the mouth. So it is the structure from which the mouth emanates from. And right here, there's a side plane of the orbicularis oris. So we're going to go ahead and paint that in with a kind of semi-transparent layer of paint, uh, very much scumbling the paint on there. And I think it's a good idea to let some of the brush strokes show, maybe leave some of the patches a little bit more rough. And it, in the end, it may even give kind of like the illusion of actual skin because our skin, we're not marble. We are not marble sculptures. So let's try to avoid over polishing the transitions between the forms. Now, if you want to make the finish look more like a marble stone finish, by all means, if that's the aesthetic you're after, that is perfectly fine. So now we're going to be filling in kind of a cooler color, yet kind of still a half tone for the bottom of the mouth right about here. Now it's very much a light half tone. It's still in the light, but if you notice this area uh, beneath the mouth is a little bit darker than the area say uh, on the cheekbones. So there's just a little bit more light right about here. Just a little more light emanating on the side of the mouth. And now we're applying a little bit more of a pinkish mixture. Let's take some more of the pink right there off the palette. And right here, we're building the volume of the nose. Right about here, we're introducing another plane as we approach the structure of the nasal bone. And that is the area that's receiving pretty much the brightest highlight. And now it's a little bit more of a half tone that's too dark, so let's take some of the paint from the palette and then just scumble it onto here. Maybe with a touch more of the zinc white and a tiny bit of the cadmium red, we're going to paint in this plane right here. So this is the bottom plane of the zygomatic region. So it's the bottom plane of the cheekbone and it's going to be turning away from the light so even though it's hard to see on the image this area right here is going to uh, have a value gradation that is going to turn away from the light and if you're trying to achieve subtlety in your value 
transitions or subtlety within your flesh tones, the key to subtlety is value compression. So keeping your values nice and compressed, meaning the values very similar to one another yet differentiated, is going to help you uh, with the subtle transitions of colors and values on the portrait. So notice we are adding a kind of more greenish tone to this area on the side of the bottom of the lower eyelid, but we don't want it to be too dark either. So maintaining that value compression by keeping the values very close to one another in this area yet differentiated is really going to help to create more depth of form into these structures. So now we're going in in the halftone region of the palette and we're going to be painting in this transition. So that's the dark light on the corner of this eye socket here. And we're going to scumble right onto the uh, lighter planes of that eye socket. And we're going to do the same thing on the other side. So with the other so eye socket, we're going to be scumbling a little bit more of a half tone into that area. And with just a little bit more pink into the mixture, we're going to be going onto the zygomatic region. So the cheekbones tend to be a little bit pinker than the surrounding flesh tones. So if we think about the large color areas of the portraits as zones, the forehead tends to be kind of a yellowish zone. The cheeks tend to be kind of on a pinkish zone. And the areas surrounding the chin tend to be a tad bit more on the greenish zone. And this will change depending on your lighting situation, the environment. Number of factors will change it. But it's a good idea to kind of group in these large color shapes as zones, just masses of color in relation to one another. So with a tiny bit more of the pink, we're going to just kind of scumble it onto the side. So we're going to be connecting the zygomatic region with the corner of the nose and trying to maintain those edges as soft as we can possibly make them. So right about here is another greenish tone that's very much a compressed value. It's darker than the surrounding areas, but not that dark. So now we're gonna go into some of the smaller structures. So the smaller structures are going to be relying on the information gathered from the larger structures. So now as we go into some of the value transitions from the eyes, here is a little value that we're painting in there that's almost imperceptible. So let's call it an imperceptible value. And an imperceptible value is a very conceptualized idea because you can't really see it too well on the image or on the model, but conceptually you know that that form is wrapping around the side of the eye, just like this plane right here, which is a little more obvious to see. This plane right here is receiving more light. So it's gonna be getting brighter and the values surrounding it are going to be getting progressively darker and darker. Now with a tad bit of burnt umber, yellow ochre, and a tiny bit of the zinc white, we now have a kind of transitioning value. And now we're gonna go in with just a little bit more of the burnt umber into this area right here. We just wanna make sure that the light and shadow are as well differentiated as we can possibly make them. So let's push the dark in this area right here so the eyelid is actually turning away from the light as it approaches the tear duct. And right about here, uh, like I said, the model has very uh, beautiful and naturally dark eyes. So this area here is going to be a little bit darker and I'm painting it a little bit darker than I usually do with my portraits.
So now we're going to add just a tiny little bit of zinc white and some ultramarine blue into this area here, giving us just a tiny little glimpse of a highlight. And that's really all it takes to get that type of image to read in space, just these simple values. And we're just going to scumble just a little bit more flesh tone right about here to create a top plane for the bottom eyelid. And now with the lips, we're going to be painting in the most important dark accents. So these dark accents, so here we have one dark accent right here on the rightmost corner of the mouth relative to your screen, and then the accent to the left of your screen, and an accent right here for the boundary between the upper lip and the lower lip. And finally, we're going to place another accent, and very much we're going to let this brush stroke show right about here for the bottom of the lips, the most important accents. So now this is another day, another sitting. We let the painting dry overnight. So we're going to come back in and mix up a nice little middle flesh tone, starting off a little bit more on the warmer side. So again, alizarin crimson and sap green, in my opinion, are two colors that were made for each other. So they very much help to uh, create a nice neutral flesh tone, especially when combined with zinc white and a tiny bit of burnt umber to neutralize the intensity of that mixture. These colors are very, uh, they work together, together very nicely. And just a tad bit more sap green into this mixture. So what I'm creating is the half tone for the corner of the shoulder. And you'll see in a second what I'm talking about. So right about here, there is a half tone as the flesh tones turn away from the light on this area of the shoulder. If you want to be exact with it, this is the trapezius of the shoulder, the little muscle right there on the corner of the shoulder, right about here. And as we make a little curve for the shadow shape, we're also imagining how the plane of the neck is wrapping around the side. In general, the overall local value of the shoulder and the chest area is lighter. The local value of the flesh tones beneath the portrait in general are a little bit lighter. So that's going to be the most important thing to note before applying any flesh tones. Uh, so remember, we're thinking about the big picture. So the most important thing, of course, was establishing those light and dark shapes. But now, as we start to introduce another value relation, we're going to be relating the values within uh, this area beneath the portrait. So we're going to be relating those values to the values that we placed on the portrait. So let's consider it a value family. So this value family right about here is going to be in general a tiny bit lighter than the flesh tones, but a tiny bit lighter, almost imperceptibly lighter. So this area right here is going to be a little bit lighter on average than the values on the portrait. So that is the values on the face. And again, it's a very imperceptible thing to notice. So the key to subtlety within your paintings is in that value compression, keeping those values very similar to one another, yet differentiated is how you create the subtlety. But then of course there are areas where you don't want to be subtle, where you want to have more contrast, such as the contrast between the dark of the hair and the flesh tones. So here we have just a little bit more light 
uh, as we approach the top plane of this area of the shoulder and right about here it's going to be more of a half tone so there's going to be more of a half tone right about here as we are approach the clavicle so the clavicle is the collarbone so the collarbone is going to create a half tone but uh, be very careful with the half tone in general the half tone is not that dark in photographs they tend to be kind of darkened a little bit too much in nature the clavicle is actually not that dark in nature it's much more subtle so this area right here is the middle between the two shoulders and it's going to be a bony connection known as the suprasternal notch now bony does not mean bony as in the sense of a skeleton bony literally means that it is a bone that is being portrayed by the planes of color that you're placing on your painting so that area of bone is going to be a little bit lighter and i left a little bit more light right there and now we're darkening the bottom area of it so again remember that the local value of these flesh tones in this area of the painting are going to be on average lighter than the values on the face and again compression is the key to subtlety so it's going to be very subtle almost imperceptibly subtle so now we're going to cover this little uh, pathway of light and so that covers that area so let's go into the clothing so now the clothing with a little mixture of alizarin crimson and ultramarine blue we now have a very deep mixture so let's add a little bit more ultramarine blue into the mixture and so now we're going to be kind of applying a semi-transparent layer of dark onto the canvas semi-transparent is the key so glazing is going to be the way that we achieve a higher level of chroma onto this surface so by glazing we're going to be applying semi-transparent layers of oil paint so here we are we're doing that right now so we have mostly a lizard and crimson and just a touch of ultramarine blue and we're letting the transparency of the application of oil paint bring out the luminosity of the alizarin crimson now water mixable oil paints i i feel like they have a little less pigment to them so it's going to be to your advantage if you're using water mixable oil paints or you want to get into water mixable oil paints to apply semi-transparent layers of oil paint in this fashion such that the white underneath of the surface in this instance the uh, warm light tone underneath the surface will be left to show through notice how it's showing through but the result is that you're seeing more of the pigment of the very chromatic alizarin crimson showing through it's almost like having a flashlight right underneath a transparent layer of oil paint it really does help to bring out the chroma of your colors so now we're just going to cover a little bit more and we're going to let some of the uh, brush strokes show through with the uh, the clothing notice how the clothing that the model is wearing is has a whole lot of information into it and i'm going to suggest it uh, with the application of paint rather than trying to paint each individual piece of it so now with a combination of burnt umber and yellow ochre we're going to be painting in this dark almost kind of goldish color and then after we're done with that we're going to come in with a little tiny size zero round brush with a little tiny bit of ivory black and clarify the edges between these shapes and with zinc white and just a touch of cadmium yellow 
we're now going to get some little sparkles of light to show through just these tiny little glimpses and that's pretty much all we need so with the big picture we focus all of our efforts onto the big picture so that we can come back in with these tiny little beautiful brush strokes and suggest things such as this little beauty mark right about here so there lives a tiny little beauty mark right here and with that that just about wraps up this week's portrait painting demonstration thank you so much for watching i really do hope that these videos are helping you out i wish you the best in all of your artwork and i look forward to seeing you on the next video